Part 1. The Trap of Common Opinion Remember the tranquility that comes when you stop caring what they say, or think, or do. Only what you do matters. Is this fair? Is this the right thing to do? Don't be distracted by their darkness. Run straight for the finish line, unswerving. Nothing needs to be emphasized more than that we should not, like sheep, follow the lead of the flock in front of us, heading not where we ought to go, but where it goes. Who is not aware that nothing thought to be good and bad looks the same to the sage as it does to everyone else? He pays no mind to what others consider shameful or wretched. He does not walk with the crowd. Just as the planets make their way against the whirl of heaven, he proceeds contrary to the opinion of the world. We defraud ourselves out of what is actually useful to us in order to make ourselves conform to common opinion. We care less about the real truth of our inner selves than about how we are known to the public. Then what is to be prized? An audience clapping? No, no more than the clacking of their tongues, which is all that public praise amounts to a clacking of the tongues. Hold on to virtue and you won't be tempted to aim at anything else. And if you can't stop prizing a lot of other things, then you'll never be free. Free, independent, imperturbable, because you'll always be envious and jealous, afraid that people might come and take it all away from you. People who need those things are bound to be a mess. Whereas to respect your own mind, to prize it, will leave you satisfied with your own self, well integrated into your community and in tune with the gods as well. Who does not willingly exchange health, tranquility, and life itself for reputation and glory? The most useless, worthless, and counterfeit coins that circulate among us. Part 2 contempt for the crowd. Who are these people whose admiration you seek? Aren't they the ones you are used to describing as mad? Well then, is that what you want to be admired by lunatics? Human affairs are not so happily ordered that the better things are pleasing to the many. A proof of the worst choice is the crowd. The judgments of common and ordinary people rarely hit the mark, and in my own time I am much mistaken if the worst writings are not those that have won the greatest share of public approval. It takes trickery to cultivate popular approval. You have to make yourself like them. If I see you much acclaimed by the populace, if your entrances are greeted by the sound of cheers and applause as we see given to actors, if the whole state, even the women and children, sing your praises, how can I help pitying you? For I know what road one must take to gain such popularity. Part 3. Time Erases Our Fame Is it this thing called reputation that worries you? Look at the speed with which everything is forgotten, the vast gulf of boundless time on either side of us, the emptiness of applause, the changeable, undiscriminating nature of those who seem to praise, the tiny space in which it all takes place. The way people behave, 
they refuse to admire their contemporaries, the people whose lives they share. No, but to be admired by posterity? People they've never met and never will? That's what they set their hearts on. You might as well be upset at not being a hero to your great-grandfather. Part 4. Properly Valuing Our Own Opinion It never ceases to amaze me. We all love ourselves more than other people, but care more about their opinion than our own. If a god appeared to us, or a wise human being even, and prohibited us from concealing our thoughts or imagining anything without immediately shouting it out, we wouldn't make it through a single day. That's how much we value other people's opinions, instead of our own. No longer be concerned with what the world says about you, but with how you talk to yourself. No one but you knows whether you are cowardly and cruel or loyal and devout. Others never see you. They only guess about you by uncertain conjectures. They do not see your nature so much as they see your artifice. So do not cling to their judgments, cling to your own. Part 5. Immunity to Insult and Opinion Remember that you are insulted not by the person who strikes or abuses you, but by your opinion that these things are insulting. So whenever another provokes you, be assured that it is your own opinion that has provoked you. What is it to be insulted? Stand by a stone and insult it. What will you gain? And if you listen like a stone, what will be gained by one who insults you? But if he has a stepping stone in the weakness of his victim, then he accomplishes something. Someone despises me? That's their problem. Mine? Not to do or say anything despicable. Someone hates me? Their problem. Mine? To be patient and cheerful with everyone, including them ready to show them their mistake, not spitefully or to show off my own self. Part 6. Contempt for Contempt It is the mark of a great mind to rise above insults. The most humiliating kind of revenge is to treat your adversary as not worth taking revenge upon. Many have taken slight injuries too deeply to heart in the course of punishing them. The great and noble are those who, like a lordly beast, listen unmoved by the barking of little dogs. Whoever gets into a fight becomes the antagonist of the other, and can only win by being on the same level. But if the wise man gets punched, what should he do? What Cato did when he was struck in the face. He did not get angry, he did not avenge the wrong, he did not even forgive it. He said that no wrong had been done. He showed finer spirit in acknowledging it than he would if he had pardoned it. If someone was going to put your body into the hands of anyone who happened to come along, you would be vexed. But that you entrust your mind to whoever you happen to meet, so that if he insults you, your mind is disturbed and confounded. Aren't you ashamed of that? Part 7. The Power of Humility and Humor If you hear that someone has spoken ill of you, do not make excuses about what was said, but answer, evidently he didn't know about my other faults, or he wouldn't have spoken only of the ones he did. In this thing they call an insult, 
what is it? They make jokes about my bald head, my weak eyes, my thin legs, my height. How is it an insult to be told what is obvious? You need not be a sage to take insults lightly, but merely someone of sense, one who might say, do I deserve these things that happen to me? If I deserve them, there is no insult. It is justice. If I don't deserve them, let the one who does the injustice blush. No one becomes a laughingstock who laughs at himself. It is well known that Vitinius, a man born to be a bud of ridicule and hate, was a graceful and witty gesture. He made jokes at the expense of his own feet and shriveled jowls. In this way he escaped the raillery of his enemies, chief among them Cicero, who were even more numerous than his deformities. When Archelaus, king of Macedonia, was walking along the street, someone dumped water on him. The king's attendants said that he should punish the man. Ah, but he did not dump water on me, the king replied, but on the man he thought I was. When Socrates was told that people spoke ill of him, he said, Not at all. There is nothing in me of what they say. Part 8 the view from higher ground. Let us rather spend what little time remains in peace and calm. Let our corpse be hateful to no one. The cry of fire in the neighborhood has often broken up a fight. The arrival of a wild beast has separated a bandit from a traveler. There's no time to struggle with lesser evils once a greater threat appears. Why do we concern ourselves with conflict and plotting? That man you are angry with, can you wish him anything worse than death? He is going to die without your doing a thing. Part 9. The Power of Empathy and Forgiveness Whenever someone does you a wrong or speaks ill of you, remember that he is doing what he thinks is proper. He can't possibly be guided by what appears right to you, but only by what appears right to him. So if he sees things wrongly, he is the one who is hurt because he is the one who has been deceived. Starting from this reasoning, you will be mild toward whoever insults you. Say each time, so it seems to him. When people injure you, ask yourself what good or harm they thought would come of it. If you understand that, you'll feel sympathy rather than outrage or anger. Your sense of good and evil may be the same as theirs or near it, in which case you have to excuse them. Or your sense of good and evil may differ from theirs, in which case they're misguided and deserve your compassion. Is that so hard? Hey guys, this is Andrew Perlot. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. Whether you want to change the world or you're just looking to be more resilient in the face of whatever life throws at you, check out my free course, Breakthrough Week. In it, you'll get the philosophical tools that some of history's greatest men and women have used to stay calm, be more productive, and thrive in a hectic world. Check out the links in the video notes below.